being here. I don't know about you, but I'm incredibly inspired by Ron Sims, and that was an amazing keynote. I'm just kind of buzzing. I, I, I confess I was feeling a little tired at the end of the week, of a, a, long, a long week, um, but I feel very encouraged and excited to be here. Um, as Sean mentioned, my name is Colleen Echoha. Um, I am the mom to these two kids right here, <laughs> True and Zoe, who are on midwinter break, so they get to come and hang out. <laughs> and um, I'm really excited to be here with my family today. My husband Matt is here, my brother Howie is here, my sister-in-law Audrey, and my sister Abigail. So I am beyond happy to be here again. I, I loved hearing the keynote from Ron Sims. He was actually somebody I met in 2007 who encouraged me to step into civic engagement in a way that I'd never done before. So it was really great to hear and see him speak and remember why I felt that passion towards ensuring that the health and well-being of our American Indian and Alaska Native people across this country are recognized and that are acknowledged as the indigenous first peoples of this land. So I at first want to acknowledge that we stand today on Coast Salish land. And I am a UWB alumni. I got my undergrad and my graduate degree here from UWB. And when I first started here, I actually, my sister was then working at the Tulalip tribes. And I asked some people out there, what does this land use for? What did the tribal people use this land for? Because I wanted to know where I was. And I wanted to know at what context the native people use this land because this land holds their memory. It holds our culture and our tradition. And the Coast Salish people use this area for gathering, hunting, and fishing within the wetlands. So thank you to those people, the first people of this land that this building sits on. I'm Abigail Echohawk, sister to Colleen, sister to Howie Echohawk, to the rest of my relatives here, and most of all, proud auntie to these two young ones, for which what we do, why we are here, lives in them. Yeah, so we're incredibly honored to be here. I see some really amazing, friendly faces in the crowd, and I'm really glad that you guys would all come. I don't know where Sean is at, but um, that's Sean, and the other Sean, <laughs> Sean Peterson, who helped um, kind of pull this whole event together. I'm just so proud when our Native sisters get to be involved in an event like this, and just um, grateful for Sean, and I'll get to hug her later. So today is an amazing day. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about ourselves, um, about our biographies, because we want, or is that my word? Yeah, yeah our biographies, right. we're still here. But um, just, just to tell you a little bit about what we do professionally and how we got involved in this kind of work. But I want to begin with just telling you a little bit about where we come from. This is a picture of our grandma Katie, actually, in uh, Alaska. This is a traditional fishing village called Bensonides. It's actually on the, um, on the banks of the Copper River. And when I moved here 20 years ago, I was the first one of us to move to Seattle, and they all came following me, which is awesome, because <laughs> we're a pack, we do our things together. Uh, I remember being so shocked when everyone was like, Copper River Salmon, coming to the Pike Place Market. I'm like, what? Because we grew up eating, we grew up eating um, fish out of this river, and this is um, our grandma, and she was a, a stabilizing force in our life for a warrior um, for indigenous rights. And then on our father's side, we're from the, um, the Pawnee people. And I was thinking about them this morning. So um, the Pawnees were originally from Nebraska and Kansas area. And we know that in the late, um, oh, mid 1800s, there was about 15,000 Pawnee people. We were strong um, people, we were a force out there on the plains. And we know that in the mid, or around 1910, when they did a census, that there were 600 Pawnee people left. And I want to acknowledge them this morning, because I think of them all the time. And when I heard Ron sharing about our endurance, that's truly what we are about as Native people. We have endured, we are here. And I think about our ancestors, that 600 people. I think about them all the time. I think about what they had to go through. I think about the loss that they experienced, the extreme amounts of trauma, and how they continued on, and they continued on, and continued on, so that now my kids can learn the Pawnee language. So now my kids know the ceremonies. We have um, endured for many, many years, and we are really, I feel like Native people, we are in a, in a new place right now. Our, our presentation is called From uh, Wounded Knee to Standing Rock, Indigenous Resistance. And we're gonna share um, along the whole spectrum of endurance, of how to stand, how to make that stand, and how to be who you are as whatever culture you're from, 
And um, we're going to do that through stories. So we're going to be sharing a lot of stories about um, what, what's happened in our lives and what's happened in the lives of our relatives. Um, I am the executive director of the Chief Seattle Club. That's my primary job. Um, I am so honored to be there to advocate on behalf of American Indian and Alaska Native people who are experiencing homelessness. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation. And I also am honored to sit on lots of different boards as part of my resistance is to sit on a board like KUOW um, and influence national public radio and to work with our local government on um, the Pioneer Square Preservation Board and the Metropolitan Improvement District Board. And, as, and, and then one of my most favorite boards ever, it is, it's my primary board, is the Red Eagle Soaring Native Youth Theater. And I'm the, I'm the past board chair. We just had elections two nights ago. And um, the idea behind Red Eagle Soaring Native Youth Theater is to, is to preserve our culture and to teach Native youth how to be confident, how to be courageous, how to be bold. Um, so definitely look them up. And I'm going to pass the torch to Al. Literally a little torch. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm Abigail Echo Hawk, and um, Colleen introduced you to our family in Alaska. We were born and raised in the heart of Alaska. And not only were we born and raised in the heart of Alaska, but we were raised in love, and we were raised in community, and we were raised in tradition, and we were raised in culture. And I can't tell you about those stories without telling you about us and who we are and where we're grounded, and this picture represents those. That is our Fish Creek. That's where that Copper River salmon goes back up to spawn, and this is our Mentasta Lake and our Mentasta Mountains, because who we are is embedded in the land. So when we go to Mentasta and I step my feet into water that could just burn your feet off, it's so cold, I am connected to those ancestors before me and to those generations ahead of me, because I am not disconnected from the land nor the people, but rather all of those things make up the mental, physical, spiritual well-being of me and of these future generations. Um, I currently work as the director of the Urban Indian Health Institute. Um, right now, about 71% of all Native people live in urban settings. Um, the Urban Indian Health Institute, we work to ensure that the health needs and health data of all of those people are represented to policymakers for them to use to ensure that they have the right programming that we need. Outside of that, I currently sit on seven boards. Like Colleen said, it's part of that advocacy, it's part of being present within the community. Um, one of the most, my most exciting board right now is I'm the chair of the Best Start for Kids, which oversees $450 million. That is a levy across King County to ensure that youth ages zero to 24, that we are truly serving them. It's an innovative program that is nothing like it in the country right now, and it defies what is going on federally. And so we have an opportunity to make change like we've never seen before. I also sit on the Hope Heart Institute, the Native Women's Dialogue for Mortality, um, Coalition to End Gender-Based Violence, and several other boards because it's so important to have our voices present in all areas of city government, county government, state, federal, and then just in the agencies that hope to serve and to address the needs of all people living in this county, in this state, and in this country. So we're, this is kind of how our presentation is based today, and I was listening to um, Ron Stem speak, and I was like, dang, this guy hit all of these. <laughs> and so our presentation is going to be split up into four areas. And um, this kind of, uh, I'm very lucky, my brother-in-law, Matt, I was trying to describe to him one day about, you know, I do all these presentations, like, I can't find a visual that represents what I'm trying to say. Because we come from a matriarchal and a matrilineal society. And the women, the hearts of the women, are what drive and sustain us. And so I was like, Matt, I need these women dancing and holding hands and working and moving together. And that's what we're doing here today. We are working and we are moving together and we are doing it in love. We are respecting knowledge. We're gonna take action. And we have always been a people of resiliency. So this is where we're gonna set up our presentation in these four areas today and Colleen's gonna start as well. All right. Well, we're gonna talk about love. And that might be kind of a, a countercultural idea when you come to these kind of workshops and presentations. But I believe that love is what anchors me to the work that I do. So I want to share it with you, talk with you a little bit about how love has um, fueled the work that I do in advocacy. And um, just want to be um, present to you and, and invite you into some of the stories of um, our family and the work that we do. 
So um, <clears throat> I'm going to start off with um, a picture of my dad. This is my dad. His name is Howard Echohawk. He is um, a part of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. And um, when he was 17 years old, he um, got some advice from a relative. We have a lot of surveyors and attorneys in our families. And so um, his dad was a surveyor, and his uncle was a surveyor, and said, hey, they're building this crazy pipeline, which is so ironic. They're building a pipeline in Alaska, and um, why don't we go out there and survey it? And you can make a lot of money, it'll be great. So he flew to Seattle, and that's as far as he could go on the money he had. And he decided to hitchhike to Alaska. So he hitchhiked to Alaska, he got to Alaska, and became homeless. He didn't have money, he didn't have relatives, he didn't have people to um, back him up. And so until he could find a job, he lived under a bridge in Alaska. Thankfully, it was the summer, so he didn't die. And uh, he's still here, he's still around. And he, uh, he became a part of Alaska culture. He met my mom there. They ended up having a, 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 how many kids together? Six kids together. We have a lot of kids in our family. Six, six of us together. I'm the oldest of those children. And we used to travel a, quite a bit um, back and forth to our, um, our village in Alaska, we passed the lake. And we also just did a lot of traveling. We, we, um, we all have terrible teeth. <laughs> and we went to the Indian Health Services clinics in Anchorage and Fairbanks. So I feel like every single week we're just like in the car for like five hours, six hours. Just, it was just disgusting. There was, you know, we had this huge van and it was full of like garbage because we were in there constantly and there was like comic books and fried chicken and Hostess cupcakes and we're grumpy and mad and we're really happy and we listen to the Sister Act soundtrack like 5,000 times. And, and it's just this crazy like adventure that we'd go on and this was what we would see often. These magnific magnificent mountains. And my dad, because he, um, had hitchhiked and even homeless, he has this incredibly soft, part, soft spot in his heart for people who are experiencing hardship. <clears throat> and he feels this incredible responsibility. I think it's in, ingrained in who we are because of what our ancestors have gone through. When we see someone who's hurting, when we see someone who's having um, a difficult time, to really go out, he went out of his way consistently to, to reach out to that person. And my mom too. And so we, uh, we would see this um, incredible um, picture as we would drive through Alaska, and often we'd see a hitchhiker. And because my dad loved his hitchhiking, you know, he remembers his hitchhiking days, he'd be like, girls! And um, this is before how he was born, actually. <laughs> girls! He, he would say girls even how he would say her, actually, too. <laughs> Poor Abby. There was five girls and one boy, he was the youngest. So, girls, and we would all, no, dad, no! He's like, we're picking up this hitchhiker, no! You know, turn off the soundtrack from Sister Act, not listening to happy music. We're, we were so mad, we threw our, everything in the back. We'd, we'd get as far back as possible so we didn't have to sit next to the hitchhiker. And I remember this one time really clearly, my dad saw way down the road, he said, we're doing it, and all the regulars screaming and crying. And my mom was like, please, no, do we have to? And he's like, we're doing it. So we get up closer and closer and closer, and this is what we saw. <laughs> And so we decided not to pick up these two. <laughs> Thank God. But one day we did pick up someone. And um, we picked him up, and my dad started talking to him. And he was a really friendly, friendly guy. He was kind of short and brown. And he was from a village way up north in Alaska. My dad started talking to him more and more and more. And um, eventually, they just start really connected at a heart level. And he was a native man, and he was homeless. And my dad said, you know what? This is a little Alaska. You're coming home with us. So we, they, we've done that before. We had guys that we picked up that eventually came to our house, but usually they left. And this guy, he ended up staying for over three years. He became a part of our family. <clears throat> I remember I was learning piano at the time, and he, uh, he, we had this really beautiful piano, and he would play it and play it, and he would teach me, and we'd talk about piano, and one day he said to tune the piano, and then he totally ruined it because he didn't know how to tune it. Um, and he, he played with us, and he was just a really amazing, friendly guy. And we really connected to him because he was a native, a native brother, a native cousin, a native relative. And so, um, but he struggled. <clears throat> he had a problem with um, alcoholism, and he had experienced tremendous tragedy in his life, was a victim of boarding schools, mm -hmm. where native kids were taken away from their families, including the boarding schools, and he lost connection with his family. And that's why he was kind of wandering around, around Alaska. So we, my parents, you know, they just loved him. We loved him. He was a part of who we were. Um, but eventually he decided to move on, and we lost track of him. 
And then um, down the road, maybe when I was like 20 years old, my aunt said, hey, I, I was in Seattle, and I, I, I heard about him. We, we talked to him. And, and then, you know, we, we were like, great, he's alive, he's doing okay. But he said she said he was homeless. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> as time went on, a few years later, we heard that he passed away. That he died of an overdose on the street. And I'll tell you guys that last year there were 20 homeless Native people who died on the streets of Seattle. And that's why I do the work that I do. I'm the executive director, as I mentioned, of the Chief Seattle Club. Um, if you are Native American and you live in King County, you are seven times more likely to be homeless than any other population. Now consider what Abby said at the very beginning of this, of this presentation. We are on Native land. This is Coast Salish territory. And last year, we had about 40 Coast Salish people who were experiencing homelessness here in Seattle. Last, in, in 2016, we had over 270 Native people who were sleeping outdoors every single night, not accessing shelters, because the mainstream shelters don't work for Native people. We make up, as Abby said, um, many Native people live in urban centers. We have 1.7% of the general population here in King County. Yet we make up over 5% of the homeless population in King County. That is a travesty. That burns me. It kills me. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about it because it's not okay. It drives me to work hard. It drives me to stand up on behalf of people who can't speak up for themselves right now. They will someday, but they can't at this very moment. And that's what happened to our friend, to our cousin, to our brother. He came here to Seattle. He thought there would be some hope here. He lost um, contact with us. He lost contact with his relatives. And he became homeless here in the city. And I, um, the Chief Seattle Club, I can't remember what our next slide is here. Our Chief Seattle Club, um, we provide all the basic needs you might um, have if you're experiencing homelessness in Seattle for American Indian and Alaska Native people. We have food, showers, laundry. We also have chemical dependency help, mental health help, and most importantly, traditional um, support. We have traditional people who come in and will help and will work with our relatives. And, and every single one of our staff, we have had people, our, our families, become part of our member of the Chief Seattle Club. And one day, I thought about our relative, who I grew up with, who I played piano with, who I ate hundreds of dinners with. And I thought, God, if he came to Seattle, it's really likely that he'd pass through the Chief Seattle Club. And I, I, I just, it just not, it came into my head one day while I was talking to the staff meeting, and during the staff meeting, I just sort of typed his name into our system. And I was shocked. I like, couldn't believe it, because he had been there the day before. He wasn't dead. And he was actually receiving services at my organization. And I was just stunned. I, I, I texted everybody, we had this huge group text, I'm like, he was here, he was here. And I had to think carefully about how do I engage with him because he's in, he's in a really hard spot. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know what I can do for him. So one day I saw that he was, he, he was at the Chief Seattle Club, he was eating breakfast, and I went up to him and I said, hey, um, I'm Colleen Eiffelhoff. And he, he kind of was like, I was like, how are Yvonne's daughter, Colleen? And he, he jumped back. He stood up and just jumped. He was stunned, shocked. And the first words out of his mouth were, do you still play piano? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, not that well anymore, but yes, I, I sometimes do. And um, we had this amazing time of reconnecting. And his story and the stories of my members are what drives me because I love them. They're my relatives, and, I, and, I, and I, I think about them, I want to work for them, I do everything for them. And the, and the heart of advocacy, the heart of being, having that heart to endure, is when you can really, truly relate and love what, what you're moving forward in. So all of us here, I, I mean, I could talk about what Ron Sim said all day today, what's gonna keep moving through this conversation. Because we all are, have that extraordinary day <laughs> to do something. And if, it's not hard, and if it's not rooted in love, if, it's not, um, if you're not moving forward in love, then it's going to not be as effective. And that is why um, the, that, that piece of love and work um, for our homeless veterans, I think about them a lot, because if you, um, Native people, we are more likely to, um, uh, to sign up for military services than any other population. 
So that means we have more and more veterans than any other population. And we have the highest rates of homelessness for amongst our native veterans. I have relatives who have served in the military. I think about them. I work for them. We have a unique perspective on homelessness because we've been removed from our ancestral homelands and are still looking for our way back. And this is actually a picture of some of our Pawnee relatives outside of an earth lodge in Nebraska. So I do it for these people. I know these people. I'm related to these people. I know their stories. I know who they are. And I'm so proud to be um, in, in love with them and with their stories. So if I can give you anything to take away from this presentation, is to find something that you love, that you're passionate about, and work towards that. <laughs> Abby and I were talking about the presentation, and um, uh, in a recent presentation I, I got to give one of the, the phrases that we used was that we've been here before and we're not afraid. We've been here before and we are unafraid. We as Native people, we have been in this spot before that many of us are in, and we are unafraid. We know that if we say rooted to love, if we say rooted and connected to who we are as Native people, we have nothing to be afraid of. I know for a lot of people right now, I've had a lot of conversation and a lot of interaction with people um, who are afraid in this environment that we're in, whether it be changes in administrations, changes within their um, being confronted more openly with racism, sexism, xenophobia, all of the things that are going on in our communities. And I asked Colleen to say that because as Native people, we have survived. I, my family, are victims of genocide. 92% of our population was killed purposefully by the government of this country. I am their greatest hope. You are their greatest hope. Because we have been here before <coughs> and we are not afraid. And to do that, to bring that advocacy, to push and resist against things that we never saw coming, we have to come with knowledge. And I was raised in story. You will notice Colleen and I talk story a lot. And that's what we call it, talk story. We're gonna talk story with you because that's how we were raised. Often our conversations won't go A, B, C, but we'll tell this story, and maybe the beginning of it, of what the point we wanted was at the end. So we're gonna talk story with you and share. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit about this idea of knowledge. So I am the director of the Urban Indian Health Institute. We have computers full of data, lots of databases, so much data, data from the federal government, data from the state, data from the country, you know, the 19 states we work in where we have Urban Indian Health Survey clinics. We have so much data and no information. Many people of color experience this. There's so much data and knowledge about us, and I say that in quotations, that has no relevance to us. So where does your knowledge come from? What is it rooted in? What is the intent of it? And for the Urban Indian Health Institute, we are indigenizing data, and we are recognizing knowledge. Because the knowledge in our communities, the greatest wealth of knowledge I have ever experienced was sitting with my grandmother, who didn't meet white people until she was 13 years old, who never graduated from the eighth grade, never went to high school or college, but her knowledge and her sustaining our entire community during a time of colonization where they took all her children from her, removed her from her land, didn't allow us to hunt and fish and be able to feed ourselves, her knowledge is what sustained us. So we have to recognize that there's multiple kinds of knowledge out there. Statistics, great. I love statistics. I love a good data set. I like a good number. But if it doesn't have the story, numbers mean nothing if it doesn't count each one of us <coughs> here. The connection to the people and assuring that as we work for us to indigenize data, that it tells the story of the people. Because I will not be dependent on the federal government, on governments themselves. I am dependent on my community on my connection. And we are moving towards self-determination. 
So self-determination is kind of like a legal term that's used a lot in Indian country. So when I say Indian country, I mean this whole country, because this whole country is Indian country. And while I definitely appreciate um, uh, Ron Sims talking about, you know, we all came from, from places, I didn't come from a land bridge. I know my creation story. Mm -hmm. I was here. Uh -huh. So even now, as people say we're a, I would caution you against saying we are a country of immigrants. I am not an immigrant. Mm -hmm. I love immigrants, <laughs> but I am not one. So think about those as we move forward in these areas of activism. <clears throat> question some of the things you're hearing. Make sure that you have the right knowledge, that you're talking to the right people. Because self-determination means is that I'm tired of being in the driver's ed car with somebody else turning the wheel when they think that we're not doing the right thing. I want my own car. I want a big car. <laughs> I want to bust through some barriers because we are moving towards self-determination. And for the Urban Indian Health Institute, that means indigenizing data, connecting to story, recognizing that there is an intent in the way that we do things. So this is a picture of me sewing for my sisters. Um, for Christmas, I decided I was going to, I, I make regalia for my family, and I decided I was gonna make them these um, ribbon prayer skirts. So if you have been following what's been happening in Standing Rock, you'll notice that a lot of women are wearing these skirts. So these skirts have the intent of that they are part of ceremony. They are a prayer, they represent the strengths, it represents the nation, the people. You can actually tell what tribes people are by the skirts that they wear, by how the ribbon is placed, how long they are, how short they are, all of those things are specific to tribal nations. And I, just, I wanted to make these for my sisters because I had been thinking about them in this time. And we all work in different areas. I have a sister-in-law, my brother's in school, Colleen doing the work that she does um, with homeless individuals. And one of the things that we do is that our strength doesn't always just come in these tidy, neat packages. And for me, I wanted to make these skirts for my sisters. And when I began to sew these skirts, and it's a lot of ribbon, <laughs> it's a lot of colors, it took me a long time. But with every stitch as I pushed through, I prayed for them. Because I was taught that when you make, when you make things, you do it with intent. What is that prayerful intent? And that when you do it, you create with a good heart, a good mind, all the bad things pushed to the side. All of those things are pushed away so that we can create with prayerful intent. And line after line after line, time after time, what can be incredibly monotonous, I did with prayerful intent. Because my community, my family, those that I love who stand in the back, who stand in the front, who support people all around, when they wear these skirts, they carry with them that prayer, that intent, that hope of a nation. And as we begin to create within the Urban Indian Health Institute, whether it be reports, data, whatever you're doing in your advocacy work, what is your intent? Was it connected to the people? Are you coming in to serve versus help or save? Because I don't need any helpers, and I don't need any saviors. But I need people who will come in with an intent to serve, to listen, to learn, to be taught the lessons that I was taught, that my grandmother was taught, that their grandmothers were taught, as we pass down this knowledge and respect those stories. I come from story, and they represent with them the strength of a nation. A stat for you. This is something we just put out on our social media. It comes from one of our reports. I'm going to have some of my team here. Raise your hand. <laughs> Urban Indian Health Institute. We have a new community health profile. This, I was very surprised by how, how well this took off. We put it out on our social media. 4.5 times more likely that a Native woman living in King County will die related to childbirth complications than a white woman. It astounds me. Like Colleen, I stay up, you know, can't sleep because I know I'm connected to, I feel the hearts, I feel the grief of my community when confronted with racism, structural racism, institutionalized racism that has created systems where Native women die 
4.5 times more than white women simply because they're native. No other reason. We are decolonizing data by pulling out information and saying, just because you don't know about it doesn't mean it's wrong. Or that doesn't mean it's not wrong. Sorry. We have to decolonize data and say that, yes, often Adrian and I, my scientific director, people tell us we don't have information. You're statistically insignificant. I'll go through a week where I'll have five people tell me that Native people are insignificant. And I refuse to accept it. And our people have refused to accept it. 92% of my people died in 100 years. But those 600 made it because they refused to accept it. Refuse to accept white supremacy, institutionalized racism, prejudice. Refuse to accept it. Gather the knowledge that you need. Strengthen your communities by being present, serving, and making things with intent. Because we have been here before, and we are not afraid. I'm going to tell you a story. Um, I'm going to start with it. So as Native people, we are people of story, and we learn from our traditional stories. So I'm going to tell you a story that I was taught. It's from the Meskwagi people, and I have permission from um, the relatives there to share this story with you. But first, I want to share with you something that my friend Roger Fernandez, a well-respected artist um, and teacher, told me about this, this type of art. It's called Formline. You'll see it a lot here in the Pacific Northwest. It's three shapes. These three shapes are used to create this beautiful art. It's molded to create from where the artist is coming from, the stories that they're telling. Three shapes create this beauty. And I want to tell you the story of the hummingbird from a squaggy tradition and story. There was a father who lived in Meskwagi community, and he was strong, and he was brave. And he taught the young ones how to be strong and brave. And when he had his own son, he sent his young son out. He was about six or seven years old. And he sent him out by himself for three days to fast and to pray. So this young man went out, and he went out by himself, and he began to sing the songs that his father had taught him. And he said the prayers that his father had taught him, that his community had taught him. And on that first day, in came two hummingbirds. These hummingbirds stayed with him. They brought him sustenance, and they taught him the medicine of the hummingbird. They taught him about how when the hummingbird's wings move, they move quickly and in the shape of infinity, never ending. They taught them how they are small, yet very agile and could move in quick, sharp ways that nobody was expecting. And they taught him about how, as hummingbirds, they had to adapt to their environment, to whether there was a drought or whether there was storms, that they had to adapt. And as we began to sit and learn these teachings, they taught him over three days. And on that third day, he opened his mouth, and those hummingbirds flew into his mouth, and they gave him their medicine. That young man went back to his community, and from then on, he was known as that messenger. He could run for hundreds of miles and not be tired. And he would teach those in those communities that he ran to the teachings that he had learned from the hummingbird. And he became a great healer and a messenger for his community. So what does that story have to do with what we're talking about? I want you to think, and uh, we're actually going to have you guys gather for like on your tables for about 10 minutes. How can this story, what lessons can you learn that can be applied to your advocacy, to your resistance, to the needs that you see present in your community? How can you learn from this story, from those old ways of inspiring people that can help you learn so that you can take those old teachings and make them new and vibrant? So 10 minutes. Chat amongst yourselves about what you can learn from the story. Yeah. We're hoping that um, you know two or three of you would be open to sharing a little bit about what you learned from the story. And I would volunteer. Yes, That's my kind of crowd, of course. <laughs> okay, we had a wonderful discussion.
I'll be brief. Um, we, um, I'll share for all of us, um, that um, from the story we learned, uh, that's important to learn, it's important to listen, to be open and accepting, and through our resilience, through our struggle, that we are, there's a claim that we're in play yet, and there's a claim that we're in the economy, it means go-between. So we learn from being the go-between, um, from the struggle to tell the story and travel and tell the story. So we carry that story in ourselves as we move through life, and that that we are also worthy of um, this, telling the story and being the, uh, the storyteller and being the content. Beautiful. Anybody else like to share? Sean. Can I just say something about, even within the hummingbird part about the hummingbird skills the agility and the quickness and the ability to move and exist in a place that allows for change, real, that hit me a, a lot when, you, when we were talking about just the, the hummingbird skills in and of itself are things that we can learn from as well. All right, thank you. I went to um, oh, one more. Yes. I was just going to say that we were really impressed by the, the importance of listening for three days. Yeah. Like to still yourself <laughs> and actually pay attention to everything, to 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 stay engaged with that for three days and really get it and then internalize it to be able to share from that place. Beautiful. So I just want to thank you all for sharing. Um, I was taught that when somebody shares a story or their thoughts on a story, that is such a gift, mm -hmm. a gift to be given to all of you. So I raise my hands to you, um, those who have shared their information and their stories with us. Um, and the tradition of the Coast Salish people, I raise my hands to you and thanks. Awesome. All right, well, we're gonna move into action. Action, and I'm gonna, you know, for me, I am a, I'm a person that loves fun. I love, um, you know, the art community, arts community. My kids and I, we love musicals, and I'm, I'm always like having people at my house and hanging out, and I'm a, um, I, I consider myself a bridge builder. But I don't like to fight, you know? <laughs> I don't like that conflict. I don't want to get into confrontation with anybody, if possible. And um, so my past 10 years of my work has been hard for me. Because I, I realized as I, um, as I moved more into leadership that I needed to confront patriotism. I, I'm patriotism, yeah, patriotism too, but paternalism. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Um, the racism that um, I occur that occurred in my life. I used to work in um, mainstream systems. I worked at UW, the main campus. I worked in um, biotech, and there were things that would come up against me that would um, I realized, crap, I'm gonna have to like say something or do something about this. And I started to want to like make change on behalf of um, my people. And this is one of my favorite pictures and like um, that I have in my slide decks. Um, and it's a picture of um, actually one of our interns at the Chief Seattle Club in front of the market. And um, part of the way that I see decolonizing um, the work that, uh, or decolonizing the systems that I have to partic participate in is by infiltration. <laughs> you heard from Abby and I, I think collectively we sit on over 15 boards together, the two of us. The reason I do that is because the native voice has been silenced. The native voice, no one has, has asked for it. I know, I'm so shocked all the time around native homelessness because we are more likely than any other population to be homeless. And time after time after time, we are left after the conversation. About 15 years ago, the city decided to have a 10-year plan to end homelessness. They started working on it. They started putting it together. They knew that Native people are more likely to be homeless than anyone else at that, po at that point. There was not one Native person that was involved in creating that 10-year plan. It wasn't until three years ago <clears throat> when I started to get involved in this work and said, why are we at the table? Why aren't you asking us for our perspectives? Because we are Native people and we know how to take care of Native people. We've done it forever. We have the solution right here. We can, we can help you make a difference. 
And so I believe that um, participating, and not just on the native and native communities and native boards, but participating on all kinds of levels. And civ it's my civic responsibility to show up and speak up. One of the boards that I participate on is Pioneer Square Preservation. And I want to tell you a little bit how I got there. I, um, I, 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 my, the Chief Seattle Club is actually in Pioneer Square. And one day the mayor's office called me and said, hey, we need you to come and testify at the Pioneer Square Preservation Board about an issue we're having at in front of our building. And I said, okay, because it was an issue I cared about <clears throat> and was important for my members of the Chief Seattle Club. And I'm sitting there in this board meeting. And as I sit in there, I start thinking, Pioneer Square Preservation? <laughs> Pioneer Square Preservation. I don't give a crap <laughs> about Pioneer. And I said another word in my head. <laughs> Square preservation. I care about Native people who are experiencing homelessness and why is that okay in this city for it to happen over and over and over again. And I'm sitting there in that meeting and it's just like in my head. So they call my name and I get to get up and I give my little presentation. At the end of it I said, I just believe it's, I'm going to say something. That Number one, we are on Coast Salish ground and I want to acknowledge the people that we are honored to be guests on this land, this very building, city hall that we're in right now. And I said, I have to be honest as a native person, Pioneer Square preservation, because I love this city, I was trying to be diplomatic, and I do love this, this city of Seattle, I'm happy to be here. But I also want us to think about the first people, how are we preserving their rights? How are we preserving the, the, the culture of the Coast Salish people? What are we doing to acknowledge that? <clears throat> And I just, I said it quickly in a couple of sentences, and it was dead silent. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> And the meeting continued on. The next day they called me and said, would you be on, be on this preservation port? <laughs> so I opened my mouth, and this is where it got me. And you know what? I've been a part of the preservation board, and I get to participate, and I get to say, hey, the other day we had someone come in, there's a brand new music festival that's going to be happening down in Pioneer Square called Upstream. And we, get to have, we got to hear about it and they were talking about how it's going to impact the neighborhood. And one of the, one of the um, <clears throat> curators said, well, it's going to be about American music, you know, from 1930s on to blah, blah, blah. And I stopped him and I said, no, listen, Native people had, were singing music down here forever. <laughs> that's American music. And I was giggling to my whole family later because I took a screenshot because it was on public record. It's a public board, right? It's, a, it's, it's your commission, you're appointed by the mayor's office. <laughs> and so now it's on public record that American, that Native people's music was here before. And you know what? Little by little, chip, like banging on that wall, it's making a difference. It's making a difference. <clears throat> so part of the action we have to take has to be fueled by fierceness, by passion, and anger. I am angry that Native people are more likely to be homeless than anybody else in this city. And that is a, not just here in the city, but that's also, also a national statistic, mm -hmm. that Native people are more likely to be homeless. That is wrong, you guys. There's nothing good about that. We should be in homes. We should be thriving. And it's because of a mass genocide that happened in this country. And we need to acknowledge it. And we need to stand up for it. And so that's why every place I go, I talk about native homelessness. And I talk about why it's wrong. I am enormously passionate. I'm obsessed with it. And I love this picture because this is a picture of a grass dancer. A grass, a grass dancer traditionally, in our, in our tradition, the Pawnee people, it, it made the, it, it, they created the path ahead of the people. When we moved from place, from village to village, or following the buffalo, the grass dancers went out in the plains and they, they, they stamped down the ground. They prepared the way for the people. It was a sacred duty. It was a prayerful duty to prepare the way for the people to come along behind them. And that's the work that I feel like I'm doing right now because we need to stamp down that grass. We need to stamp down the racism against Native people and that Native people are more likely to be homeless than any other people. I want to tell you a quick story as I finish my section of this about Something that occurred to, with my whole family, actually, here, my little, <coughs> my little unit, about a year ago in Hawaii. My husband is from Hawaii, and um, my sister and my brother-in-law live there. My brother-in-law is Maori. 
um, from New indigenous from New Zealand. So him and my sister are like these super indigenous couple <laughs> and indigenous kids. And we happened to be there when my brother-in-law was hosting about 300 Maoris from New Zealand. And it was a, it was a Maori immersion school. Um, what we know about Ma the Maori people is that they have really led the way in indigenous language um, renaissance. About in 19, 1970s, they realized there was only five people under the age of 30 that were fluent in the Maori language. And they started, they, they, took, they took action. And as they say, it was like Maori people for Maori people. The Maori people had a huge renaissance of their language and culture. And so um, they have these, um, these schools that are fully immersed in the Maori language. And so my brother-in-law was hosting one of those schools and there was, it was amazing, 300 um, individuals. I think that there was like 200 kids and then there was like 100 parents. At the same time in Hawaii, <clears throat> there was um, some really significant things happening for Hawaiian people. Out of Mauna Kea, the University of Hawaii wanted to build an um, observatory. It was going to be one of the most amazing observatories that ever happened in the whole U.S. history, right? And they were saying because of that, of the impact on science, and because we don't know enough about it, we're going to place it on a sacred site. Mauna Kea is known as like the, the place of life where it all started. It is enormously sacred for Hawaiian people. And it's something I greatly, greatly respect. <clears throat> and when I've been to Hawaii, we, 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 we consider that. We, take, we pray about it. We think about it. Because I'm an indigenous person. So this was happening at the same time. And up on Mauna Kea, there were protesters. They were actually protesting so that there would not be any uh, construction that happened on this, up on this mountain, Mauna Kea. And um, my brother-in-law said to my family, and he said to the team was there, let's go up to Mauna Kea and let's go support this, this, this um, endeavor. So we go up, there's like five huge buses, and we're in their like old car, and we, we go up to Mauna Kea. And when we get there, we find out that they're not going to allow us to actually go up on the mountain. There's a road that goes up the mountain. Because um, actually, it was the University of Hawaii said, no, we're not letting anyone go up there. Um, we had our friends up there <clears throat> who were up there protesting, and they had camped out and had been there for a long time. And so we called them, and we made the arrangements, and they said, okay, we'll come down and meet you. And basically, meet us on the side of the road where there was this parking lot. And so they come down, and you guys, they were tired. This is them. There were just a few of them. They come down. They look exhausted. I knew some of them. We hug, we kiss, we talk about the work that they're doing. And they, they're, they're, they were so resilient. You could not, I, I was so impressed by them. And I also was in tears because I thought, my God, there's so few of them. And they're standing up against the University of Hawaii. They're standing up against science, the almighty science God, right? How the hell are they going to do this? Like, my heart was breaking for them. And so, the Polynesian culture, I don't know if you know how, you probably don't know how this works, but they have these beautiful ceremonies that they do together, that they know together. And the way the ceremonies go is they want to invite you into the land or invite you into the culture. So one group will stand on one side, so the, the New Zealand group, the Maori group sit on one side, and the Hawaiian group sit on this side. And then they sing back and forth to each other. It's kind of incredible. They'll give a speech and they'll say who, they're, who they are and where they're from, and then they sing a song. And the whole group sings a song. And then the other side does the same. And so, <clears throat> because we were with my brother-in-law, we sit on the side with the Maoris. And this Maori school, part of what they do is they sing together. So it's incredible. You feel like, oh my gosh, you can feel the ancestors. You can feel the prayers. You feel everything. And then it was the turn of the Hawaiians. And there's just a few of them. And their songs are not as loud because there's only 15 of them. And there's over 300 of us. But they're powerful, and I knew the words of the songs because I've lived in Hawaii, and I know that got part of that culture. And um, you're inspired by their tenacity, and also my heart was just hurting for them. And so we're doing this beautiful ceremony <clears throat> at the base of Mauna Kea in, the, in, in, in total resistance to what, what, what the mainstream wanted to have happen. And all of a sudden, down the road comes this bus. And there's a lot of buses that go by that road, so I don't really pay attention. 
but I noticed that it was Puanaleo, which is the Hawaiian Immersion School. So the Hawaiians, and as well as other indigenous people in this country, maybe the Pawnee people as well, we've learned from the Maoris about, about the renaissance of language and how if we can get our kids to speak in a language, starting in preschool and then moving on, moving on all the way up to college, that we can see a renaissance of culture as well. This language is directly related to culture, directly related to spirit. And so um, the, I saw the Puanaleo, that was the name of the, the Hawaiian Immersion School. <clears throat> I saw it go by. And then I saw it come back around. It flipped around, the bus did. And the bus stops, and about 50 little Hawaiian kids come running off the bus. And they come running over, and I don't have, wish I had the picture, they come running over, and they stand all around these guys. And um, the other side was seeing, oh, you can see, you can see that they're all in the little red shirts here. The other side was doing their part, the Maori part, <clears throat> and I immediately start crying because I know what's about to happen. <laughs> and so, all of a sudden, you see these little kids, and they know the songs because these are their elders. They know these people. They're, they're, they're related. Remember I said they love each other. They're, they're in relationship with each other. And they start, the other start, side finishes their song and their speech, <clears throat> and then this elder starts speaking, and he does his speech, and you know what? It's so much stronger. He feels the power, the mana of these little kids behind him, and he's speaking, and he's in its strength and, and, and in solidarity of the work that he has to do, because he's been up on that mountain. He's been up on that mountain for days and days and days, because he's defending the sacred space, defending it for these kids. And then they start singing, and whoa, these kids sing with fierceness, with passion. They're just like, they know the songs. And they sing, I could never be lost. I am a seed, born of greatness, descended from a line of cheese. That is who I am. And we all just melted because we're just like weeping because the spirit <clears throat> The ancestors were singing along with them. That birthplace of Hawaiian people, that indigenous spirit was strong. And it started a long, long, long time before us. And that's why Abby and I started our presentation about our ancestors. Because they walk with us. We're not alone. We've been here before, and we're unafraid. You'll notice Colleen and I talked a lot about our family, our community, our tribes, our connection to one another. And I gave a presentation recently, and one of the feedback that I got was like, oh, they talked, you know, like, I didn't know we were going to learn her whole life history. <laughs> <laughs> I took it as a compliment. <laughs> because as indigenous people, we are people of story and of connection. And to connect with one another takes vulnerability. And it is hard to be vulnerable. But resistance takes vulnerability. It takes going into boards where nobody even knows what a native person is and bringing the needs of our community, the strengths, the beautiful parts of our community to those organizations. It takes vulnerability to tell the stories of genocide, of inequality, it takes vulnerability to share who we are and to give our everything to make change for our people. And that's what resilience is in our community. Resilience isn't we survived, thank God we're still here. Again, 600 Pawnee people, we didn't just survive. Colleen and I stand here today because we thrived. We held on to who we were, and we be who we say we are. And how do I know who I am? I learn from my relatives, from my community, from my ancestors, telling me those stories, sitting, listening, connecting, being vulnerable, taking risk, and using that to take that anger, and instead of letting that anger become bitter and overtake me, where I can barely make it through a day because of all of the aggressions, microaggressions, racial aggressions, 
white supremacy, all of the things that a person of color that we get hit with every day. Is I could just retreat into myself and let that overcome me. But instead, we take it on with fierce passion and use that anger to fuel change. Be who you say you are. This is in one of our ceremonies, a potluck ceremony in Alaska. And those are my two sons, our only one son right there. And he's following one of our um, relatives who is teaching him how to serve food. So in our ceremonies, the men serve all the food. And the older ones teach the younger ones. And when we sit, it'd be really easy with, this was at a, a ceremony that had 1,200 people, to set up a potluck style, you know, you just go and get food. We serve everybody individually, and we sit back to back, face to face, to build community because we will be who we say we are, and those young ones will learn that because it is their futures that we are fighting for. I encourage you to grow roots. As Native people, historical trauma, genocide, all the things that we experienced, the whole point of them was to pull us out by our roots, shake that dirt off us, and throw us to the side. But our roots were too deep. They were too interconnected. And the strawberry plant, I received this teaching in the Anishinaabe people, the strawberry plant, it's so intertwined. The roots are connected to each other. They intertwine, and you cannot get rid of them. <laughs> Be like that strawberry plant. Don't let somebody shake the dirt off you and throw you to the side. Grow ro roots in your community. Connect to one each, each other. Be vulnerable. And understand that it is nobody alone, but rather us all together. In our communities, nobody is the savior. Colleen and I have been raising our family to move forward and we're supported. Like, I don't get it, you know, I moved into this new job. I asked my family if it was the right thing for me to do. Because they placed me in these places and I hope soon I step aside and that next generation takes my place. Because we are not there to save, but rather serve. And instead of trying to find the place where you'll be, that voice in the front, how do you support those that are already there? It's not about seeking out the biggest accolades and the most applause. Sometimes it's serving food and sweeping up afterwards. Grow roots. Build community. This is one of my favorite pictures, again, from a ceremony. Um, a potlatch ceremony where our family gathers and we sing and we dance and we come with eagle feathers and we carry paddles and we're we, we wear leather and we have beads but we're also wearing Jordans and Nikes and Adidas <laughs> and Levi's and everything modern that you see because our resiliency has been about big, bold, beautiful change not just survival and we are moving in our own healing. And each of us needs to move in our own healing, whatever way that looks like. Because when we're talking about it as love, as building hope, as compa compassion, <coughs> I do what I do because I love those two so much that I would give my life to them. And I love you. And we sacrifice and fight because we love humanity and our connection to each other. There is no action that I want to take that would harm any of you. Because we are all connected. Love, knowledge, action, resilience. We have been here before and we are not afraid. I'm going to close with one story. Um, and this is my favorite pair of earrings. I'm wearing them today. <laughs> Not only because I love jewelry a lot, I kind of collect, you know, my, I love native jewelry, um, because it all tells a story. It has a meaning. And so it's just not like our native artwork just isn't something on the wall. It means something. It has a spiritual connection. It has a physical connection. So I want to tell you the story of my earrings. Um, and these earrings were given to me uh, when I was visiting the Nez Perce Reservation in Lapway, Idaho the Nimipu people, Chief Joseph's people, land of the butterflies. When I was given these earrings, they, they said, you know, I want to give you this, I want to tell you the story. Because as you go out and you travel in Indian country, I want you to remember these earrings and think of them about as strength. And she told me that when the Nimipu people began to clash with the US government, 
um, the cavalry, they'd have these big battles, these big wars, and our people would die. Children, women, men, elders, our people would die in these big battles as this push for land came from the settlers who were coming in. But after those battles, the people would go back to the battlefields to bury their dead. And in doing that, the women would go out and they would search out all of the bullets. And the bullets were made out of copper. They would seek out all of these bullets that would be all over the land, these weapons of mass destruction. And the women would gather them up. And they would gather all these bullets together and then they'd take them back to their camp. And they'd melt down those bullets and they'd use them for a variety of things. They'd use them for utensils, they'd use them for digging, they'd use them for arrows, they'd make bullets. They reused all of those. But one of the biggest things that they did is they would take those bullets and they melted them down and created these studs. And they put these studs into these, these shells, which were a traditional adornment from them. And the woman who gave me these earrings, she told me, as Native people, as Native women, as people of resiliency, we have always taken the weapons that have been used against us and turned them into beauty. We always see the beauty. For no weapon shall destroy us. And I carry that strength with me in these earrings. And as Native people, Indigenous people across this land, we carry that strength. So if you're a UW Bothell student or live in this area and you take off your shoes and you walk on that dirt out there and you are soul to soil, you are connected to that land and to that legacy before you. So you'll notice we didn't talk anything specifically about Wounded Knee or Standing Rock. <laughs> Did we need to? The fight that indigenous people have always been and have always fought, now we're just seeing it more because of social media, but we have always been, we will always remain. We've been here before and we are not afraid. And we ask you to join us in that. And whatever your advocacy may be, for your love of humanity, for the resilience you want to see in your community, for the change that we all want to be, stand with us soul to soil, connected. You're all. Awesome, thank you guys.